Good morning. I want to start by asking a question. Have you ever heard the Holy Spirit cry? Have you ever heard the Holy Spirit of God cry? Do you know what the weeping of the Holy Spirit sounds like? I'm talking about the Holy Spirit who is the power of God in the world. The Spirit who works out the will of God in the world. The Spirit of the living Christ. The same Spirit who moved over the waters when the earth was empty and formless. It's the power of the Almighty God which was at work in the raising of Jesus from the dead. The Spirit which tore the temple curtain and turned the sky dark and took away death's sting. That's the Holy Spirit I'm talking about. It's also the Spirit that fell in flames from the sky on the disciples at Pentecost. And it's the Spirit who descended on Jesus like a dove. Have you ever heard that Holy Spirit cry? Now you may wonder why I'm asking that question when our topic for today is resentment or anger. But the link is in the last two verses of the passage which Andy read to us. Uh, And we'll pull those two verses up on the screen here. Where Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Now, this is a familiar text to most of us, and there are a number of other similar texts in the New Testament listing things that we need to try and change in our lives or behavior we need to emulate. But what does the first part of the verse say? Well, the first verse says, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, or don't cause grief to the Holy Spirit. And when you read the passage together, those two verses, it's clear that the second verse is advice on how to avoid the first verse, causing grief to the Holy Spirit. So anger, rage, bitterness, cause grief to the Holy Spirit. And what do people do when they're grieving? We use the word mostly in English today when uh, somebody dies, when the person who is grieving has lost somebody. It's a strong word, They cry. They weep bitterly. Their heart is broken. So my conclusion, which I I came to a, a few years ago when I was reading this, is that when we are angry, bitter, show malice, the Holy Spirit cries. We cause the Holy Spirit to cry. We break his heart. I was shocked when I first realized it. I'm angry often. I cause grief to the Holy Spirit often and I make him cry. And if you're equally shocked, then together we need to understand why does this behavior make the Holy Spirit cry and what can we do about it? So today's sermon is the first of four in a series looking at uh, characteristics of our old life that we need to put off. Um in order to be able to put on the character of Jesus, or as we sang earlier on, the rags that we need to put off so that we can put on the character of Jesus. To help us remember, I'm going to use a mnemonic, rags, which uh, I've actually borrowed from from John Ortberg, uh, and it's one letter for each week, so resentment, anxiety, greed, and superiority. Today we're going to talk about resentment or anger, and then we'll cover anxiety or worry, greed, and superiority. All parts of our natural self that need to be put off in order to put on the character of Jesus. So let's look a bit at what anger or resentment actually is. We need to be clear about what we're talking about when it comes to anger, Some people don't see it as a totally negative thing. 
Some people will argue it can be useful or a good thing, other things, other that it's a natural emotion and so it needs to be shown. Others will argue that there's a righteous anger like that which display, which uh, God's displayed in the Bible. But let's look at a few verses. First one is in Proverbs. An angry man stirs up dissension and a hot-tempered one commits many sins. Or Jesus says in Matthew, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And then thirdly, James says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. I remember once when I was about 18, uh, I was living at home with my parents, and we, we lived in Italy at the time, and we had, some, had a couple who were visiting us from, from Canada, and the habit in our household was to have very long dinner times, usually an hour and a half, two hours, and very interesting discussions. And I, I was generally a listener rather than a participant. But on, on this particular occasion, um, a discussion developed on the subject of anger and whether anger was always wrong or not. And some of the table said, no, it's always wrong. It's, it's too risky. You can't allow anger. It's, it's always wrong. And others said, no, it's okay if it's righteous anger. And I remember the discussion particularly because as it went on, the tension in the room rose. It wasn't just an exploratory discussion in which people were exploring, but it was one where people took positions and they stuck to them and they dug in. And they dug in deeper and deeper. And in fact, as the tension in the room continued to rise, I wondered whether we were going to see a display of anger from one side of the argument or the other. I also remember that discussion distinctly because it, it helped me form my view. And, and from that point, I personally have left, uh, I left that discussion and I, I've, I've formed the view that anger amongst humans is, is always wrong. And I've looked at the topic quite a bit, particularly from the biblical perspective, and I've, I've come to the same conclusion. Um, there are many examples in the Bible of people being angry. Cain was angry and killed Abel. Moses was angry with the people that he was leading and he actually broke the law of God, the stones that God had just given him in his anger. Saul was angry by nature and he tried to kill David on several occasions and others. And David burned with anger when he was confronted with his sin by Nathan the prophet. By my reading, none of those examples are constructive, uplifting, and leading to something positive. And they're not portrayed as such in the Bible. Now, if you've got other examples that you can give me where you feel there are good expressions of people ang people's anger, where it was constructive, uplifting, then please do come and Tell me, I'm, I'm, I'm open to hearing about them. But by contrast, there are also many examples in the Bible of God's anger. But we are told God is slow to, be ang slow to anger and he's abounding in love. And his anger only lasts a moment. And time after time, he restrained his anger. Now, I, I think God's anger is righteous but I also think it's something we need to leave to God. He has the prerogative and we don't. And we need to avoid it. Now there's another view that you may hear or you may feel yourself. Anger is a natural human characteristic. It's part of who we are. We can't help it. Then we need to go back and say, yeah, there's a lot that is a natural part of our human nature. That is sinful. And we're not excused from it. We're only offered forgiveness and help to change. That's what the Gospel's about. 
But if you struggle with whether anger is always wrong or not, if you struggle to get rid of anger because you're not sure about the definition of anger, I have an easier solution. Focus on resentment, which is actually the title for today. Focus on resentment and bitterness. It's resentment, after all, that's the biggest cause of anger. Focus on ridding yourself of resentment. When you've got that sorted out and under control, then I have a feeling your definition of anger won't be a struggle anymore. So resentment also is a normal, natural human reaction. When we're wronged, when we're ignored, when we're hurt by somebody, we feel resentment. It begins with the feeling of something isn't fair. And very often something isn't fair. That we haven't been given our rights. But it grows. And resentment can't be contained and limited. You can't say, I'm only going to be resentful towards that person about that particular fact or that particular insult that they gave me and everything else I do in relation to that person I'll be very positive and the relationship won't be affected. Like most other sins, you can't put a limit on resentment and stop it. You need to rid yourself of it. We need to rid ourselves of it. And that's why Ephesians 4 verse 27 says, don't let the sun go down while you're angry. As Andy read, don't give the devil a foothold. Allowing resentment to stay in your life allows the devil to get a foot in the door, which he'll then continue to pry open and to spread. First, it may just be resentment, but if we don't deal with it, it'll extend to other areas of sin in our lives. Gossip, slander, hostility, withdrawal, even physical abuse of our bodies by suppressing anger rather than dealing it with it. All of those are other extended areas of sin related to resentment. So, resentment or anger is wrong because it lets the devil get a foothold. Let me give you a few other reasons why I, I think it's wrong. It's also wrong because it damages relationships. And that's not just if we exhibit it. Clearly, if we're angry to, towards someone in an outspoken way. But if we have angry thoughts about somebody, it will affect the way we relate to them, the way we talk to other people about them. It puts a block on the way we share the Holy Spirit with people. Resentment blocks that flow of the Spirit. And in terms of talking about relationships, God's in the business of building up relationships. The devil is in the business of tearing down relationships. So when we allow resentment, bitterness, anger, we're leaning towards tearing down relationships, not building them up. Or in the very perceptive metaphor that C.S. Lewis uses in his book The Great Divorce, we are walking away from heaven rather than walking towards it. So, resentment gives the devil a foothold. It damages relationships. Thirdly, it's wrong because it makes the Holy Spirit sad. As we said before, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And fourthly, it's wrong because it's not part of the heavenly characteristic God wants to create in us. He wants to start creating those characteristics in us now. The kingdom of heaven starts today. There's continuity between today and heaven. As Grace was showing us this morning, talking to us about our friends in heaven will be the same people largely as the people we knew on earth, plus more. But there's continuity. We are the same person going through from now to heaven. And God wants to start work on us and our characters today. We're not going to go around living our lives on earth and then suddenly completely changed into somebody completely different, into new beings. We need to start work on that today. 
The passage in Ephesians very clearly says, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So there's four reasons for, from, from me why I think resentment and anger are wrong. So, what is it, anger, resentment? Well, physiologically, it's a reaction in the body. There's a bunch of nerves in the middle of our brain, or two bunches actually, they're called the amygdala, and they play a central role in the development of anger and other emotions. They send signals, when there's a trigger, signals to other glands around our body that do things like put adrenaline into our bloodstream, tighten our muscles ready for action, focus our minds so that we're not distracted by by other things. Uh, Interestingly, the amygdala are also related to the body's reaction to fear and to pain. So it's, it's no surprise that we feel angry when we're afraid or we're threatened or when we're in pain. Think about that the next time you hit yourself on the thumb with a hammer or stub your toe. So the reaction is in fact natural. It's developed in our bodies over the years as a a rapid response to danger. It's developed as supporting survival and self-preservation. In fact, there's, there's much in the human character that is developed and useful for self-preservation but that is not useful for building up the kingdom of God and not useful for a life of service to other people. So, whether you believe these characteristics have evolved evolved in us over millions of years or if you believe they're part of the fallen nature which we have, having turned from God, and I, I personally believe both of those, they are characteristics that we need to get rid of and that we are told to put off. How do you react to anger in your life? We're told, in your anger, do not sin. So it's a good idea that we know our own way of reacting. In my own home as a child, there was a lot of anger shown very... uh, Externally, a lot of visible anger, a lot of shouting and physical showing of anger. My own reaction to anger instead is to keep it in, to try and hide it, to smother it. I read an article once that had three different categories of people that may be useful. They're called uh, a splatter, a stuffer, or a leaker. So these are all three ways that you may find you deal with anger. None of them are very flattering names. Stuff, uh, splatter, stuffer, or leaker. But uh, see if you recognize any of the characteristics. See if you recognize yourself in any of them. So a splatter is somebody who shows angered, anger outwardly. Loud, makes a big mess, but it's over quickly. A stuffer is someone who keeps it all in and builds the pressure up. And it affects both the person themselves and their behavior towards others. And then a leaker is someone who doesn't show the anger directly, but it leaks out the side somehow. They gossip, they criticize the person who they're angry with, and it causes damage around and about in other other situations. Do you recognize yourself in any of those? Maybe you've got another analogy. It's not really important what analogy you have, but it is very important to know yourself and to know how you react, because only then can you work with God's Spirit to change it. I think it's important to point out, we're talking about changing character, not changing personality. The way I think of it, your personality is your outward, the outward you, who, how you appear, what your natural behavior is. Are you extrovert or introvert? Are you loud, quiet? thoughtful or impulsive. If you're an extrovert, God's not looking to make you to an introvert or vice versa. He wants to change your character. The character is the very moral fiber of who we are. 
or the direction we're walking in life, our very inner orientation, the direction our heart is facing. Remember, heaven starts today. So, if you're a splatter, God doesn't want you to start stuffing your anger down inside you to hide it and think it's dealt with. If you're a stuffer, God doesn't want you to start expressing your anger more so you can get it over and sin less. God wants to go to the root of your anger, your bitterness, your resentment, and he wants to deal with that. He also expects you to start with what you've got. One thing that comes across very clearly in the New Testament is that we're all different and we all have different personalities, different gifts, different weaknesses, different strengths. And we all need to start from where we are today. There's continuity in life. We start from where we are and there'll be continuity all the way to heaven. The fascinating thing is that it's the same spirit we cause to weep if we allow anger in our lives as the spirit which we're given to deal with anger. It's the same spirit that we block by allowing sin in our lives. So, how do we get started with it? Or if you're already well on the journey, how do, how do we take some more steps in the right direction? I've got four suggestions. And um, if they look like disciplines, they are. They're a very practical way of dealing with habits which are our nature. And discipline is the way God's chosen to work in us. He's, he hasn't said, here's my Holy Spirit, hand everything over to me and I'll, I'll take care of the rest. He's provided us with disciplines which release the power of Spirit in us. Jesus was a great example. His life was very disciplined. So the first one is solitude, and that means taking time alone, in quiet with the Lord. And in, we're talking specifically now about anger and resentment. It means asking the Spirit to show you your anger, your resentment, your bitterness. So if you, you already spend time alone with the Lord, great. Use that time to ask the Spirit to show you these things in your life. It's also important to look at what is it that tends to trigger this anger and this resentment in you? Is it the time of day? Do you find you're more irritable certain times of day? Is it certain people you interact with? Is it when you feel like you're out of your depth and you can't control things, do you get angry? Is it when you're in pain? Is it when you're tired? Or is it some other situation? Take time with God to recognize your own anger what causes it, and then also how it displays itself. Do you gossip? Do you use sarcasm? Do you criticize? Do you shout? Do you avoid people? Secondly, confess. Now this comes hand in hand with the solitude. It means accepting what you've learned and asking forgiveness of the Lord when he's shown you your resentment and your anger. If you're like me, you'll be surprised by the number of times each day when you're angry. And I'm not just talking about when you have no right to be angry, but every time. When someone insults you, forgets you, shows no interest in you, jumps ahead of you in a lineup or in traffic, when someone lets you down at work, when you drop the hammer on your toe. So part of Confession is also planning to behave differently. Confession is about turning away from the sin. Our nature as humans is to be creatures of habit. We follow our habits. The only way we change them is to change them, to work on it. And we can't change them simply by wanting to change them. We've got to prepare ourselves, plan our reaction, and then practice. Take driving a car as an example. 
When you're out driving, if you're a driver, and you approach a roundabout or an intersection, how many of you think, release gas, press clutch, move gear shift, foot to brake, engage gear, look carefully, release clutch, foot to gas, and so on? My guess is you can probably hold a conversation with the person sitting next to you while you're doing all of that. You do it naturally, but you didn't in the beginning. You had to learn to drive. And part of learning to drive is learning what to do. But the bigger part of learning to drive is training your body to do all of those things without having to think about it step by step. You use discipline, habit, reactions. And I think this is a helpful way of thinking about how we allow the spirit to work in us. We need to train our bodies and our minds to react as we approach the roundabouts of anger or the intersections of anger. We also need to remember that this is not just a discipline of a habit, but the difference between allowing the Holy Spirit to flow and giving the devil a foothold. Let me give you an example. There's a person in my extended family who I know, who I've learned, causes anger within me. Who they are and their behavior makes me angry. And when I'm with them, I find those behaviors niggling me. When I'm away from them, I don't. In fact, I I long to be with them. I long to see them. I find it hard to believe that I'm going to react that way when I see them but I do. Uh, And I came to this realization a few years ago when I was seeing this person. I needed to prepare myself ahead of time in prayer. So I took time of silence with the Lord and I wrote down the situations in which I remembered being angry. And I looked to see if there were trends, behaviors, things that they said which triggered my anger. And when I had all of those, I planned how I was going to react in future when I, when I saw those behaviors. I actually said, when they turn the conversation to this topic, then I am going to. And my planned reactions ranged from leaving the room, removing myself from the situation, to following the conversation and absorbing the pain. And then I prayed through those reactions and asked God for helping help in implementing them. And the amazing thing that I found was it actually when I met this person again and I saw the behavior that I knew annoyed me, I implemented the plans and it worked. I didn't feel the resentment in the same way. I didn't build up. The devil didn't get a foothold. And I was able to be more loving and more valuable in the relationship. Unfortunately, I haven't been so consistent in using that discipline in other areas of anger in my life. But when I have, it's been successful. And I encourage you to try Thirdly, forgiveness is the other side of it. We've talked about confession. Forgiving means turning towards the source of our anger or what triggers it and forgiving that person. That may mean actually going to the person and expressing that forgiveness or it may simply mean giving the issue to the Lord in quiet and determining not to hold that issue against the person again. It's very hard and it's a discipline and it needs practice. And it can only be done with the help of the Holy Spirit. But what power? Think of Jesus on the cross who said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And Stephen, when he was being stoned, said, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. There's huge power in that. It actually means not holding what triggers your resentment against the person who shows it, relating to them as though they didn't behave that way. And then finally, the fourth proposed discipline is sacrifice or service. And this is exciting. It actually means taking yourself in God's strength back to the fire that burns you, but in a different spirit. It means putting on the shoes of a servant and serving the person who irritates you. 
And the service is not, by the way, to point out the weakness to them that you see, nor even to expect change in their behavior. It's a discipline in you, a way of allowing God's Spirit to grow Jesus' character in you. I read a book some years ago about uh, forgiveness and the story that's illustrated on the cover caught my attention. Um, it, a number of you may recognize it when I describe it. It's a picture of a Vietnamese girl whose photo was on the cover of uh, newspapers and magazines around the world in the 1970s. She was about eight or ten years old, naked and running towards you, running away from her village, which was burning behind her. American planes had bombed her village. And you can see the terror and the fear in her eyes. Now, usually those sorts of photos, which are far too common nowadays, just pass into history. But in this girl's case, when she grew up and became a woman, she decided to go to the United States and meet people who had fought against her country. She spoke at gatherings of war veterans and spoke against war generally. And one day, she came face to face with one of the pilots who had actually bombed her village. And while he sobbed and asked forgiveness, she offered it. This woman dealt with her resentment, which as we all know, would have been a natural reaction, by getting up and going to the source and serving it and sacrificing It's a very powerful discipline and we can apply it in many simpler situations in our lives than this one. So approach the source of your anger and serve and sacrifice. Think about how you can perform acts towards those, acts of service towards those who make you angry. If you can make them hidden acts of service, even better. There's something very powerful in God's economy in terms of hidden acts of service. And when they're hidden, you can also be sure that you're working to change your own character and not trying to change theirs. God works extremely powerful through those acts of service. So let me just give a quick summary of what we've gone over today. Don't make the Holy Spirit cry. Anger and resentment are very natural components of our human body and our human nature, but they do need dealing with. The kingdom of heaven starts now. That just means... There's continuity in life from today to heaven. Start to work on allowing God to implant his character in your life. And God doesn't want to change your personality, just your character. And then four suggestions of disciplines to provide a mechanism for you to allow God's spirit to work on anger and resentment in your life. Solitude, confession, forgiveness, and sacrifice or service. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for giving us the Bible as a means for us to learn your way for us. And we thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit as a means for us to put off our natural old character and put on the character of Jesus. And we pray that you would help each of us, Father, at the point where we are today in our lives to think about the next steps going forward 
to think about those things that irritate us, that cause resentment, cause anger in our lives. And think about how we can allow you to work with us to change them. We do praise you for the power of your work in our lives. And we give ourselves to you today. In Jesus' name, Amen.